more land from this egregious uh, outdated law. Private land conservation. We the controversy for public for natural resource management is typically fought on public lands. In fact, the national forest, the BLM land in particular, are really the wrestling mat for how people view natural resource policy. And perhaps that's as it should be. But the real aim for increasing biodiversity, for enhancing water quality, watershed restoration, are really on private lands in the United States because that's where most of the land is. For example, uh, the National Resource Research Council uh, report found that we have uh, 9.9 million private woodland owners in the United States and only about 5% have professionally based, science-based plans for their land. And this is not Uncle Sam or somebody from the state capital telling you what to do with your land. It's simply whatever your objective is, you get scientific, professional expertise mm -hmm. to help you achieve those goals. And, yet, uh, and it's free in most cases, and yet only a small proportion of private landowners seek that help, and it's so important. But the, the one thing that I want to talk about that affects Montanans is urban forestry. You know you don't have the urban areas in Montana, just, but you have to think that they want. Greg McPherson, uh, a Forest Service researcher at UC Davis, did a study shortly after the California energy crisis a few years ago, and he found that uh, the, the 177 million trees in the state of California uh, provide shade that saves ratepayers about a half a billion dollars a year in air conditioning costs, and it saves the utility industry about one billion dollars a year. And if they planted another 50 million trees in the state of California, that's the equivalent savings of five 100 megawatt generators. If we take a look at the trees in the United States and the cities and towns and urban areas that cover about 100 million acres of what were formerly forests, the Forest Service State and Private uh, group tells us that we have room for another 700 million trees without busting up any concrete. And if we combine plant of those and we combine it with the existing trees in urban areas, that's the equivalent saving of 30% of the annual production of Anwar uh, for the next 50 years. Now, it seems to me that any national energy strategy without an urban tree planting component is badly flawed. This is a no-brainer. <laughs> it's easy. We know how to do it. Uh, so important. And my last issue uh, is ecological literacy and education and communicating to the public. And I don't mean those of us in the room talking to one another. I mean those of us telling people why land is important. Something people connect people to nature in the most visceral way. Wild places do that. Public lands do that. In fact, if we take a look at the greatest good for the greatest number for the long haul, and we apply that to all public lands, it's probably going to be education, it's going to be water, it's going to be spiritual renewal. Different values than 100 years ago or 50 years ago. Uh, but it's <coughs> more important. And our challenge is to help people understand why land is so important to cherish land. Land. I want to close by telling a couple of stories. Uh, as uh, I got thrust into uh, big controversial issues, uh, say a little bit over a decade ago or so ago, um, I started spending more and more time in the history of conservation, uh, the public domain, the BLM, the Forest Service, the various agencies and uh, learned a lot, and learned that many, many things are easy to And then I, I thought about September 11th, uh, when that occurred. And then I thought about a tragedy that occurred about 100 years before that, on September 6, 1901. And that was uh, when an assassin's bullet hit President McKinley when he was attending the Pan Am Exposition in Buffalo, New York. At that same time, Theodore Roosevelt, as vice president, was giving a speech to the Vermont Fish and Game League. He was summoned to New York to be at the president's side. He got to, New York, or rather, to Buffalo. He got to Buffalo. Um, it appeared as though Mint McKinley was going to recover. He decided to get out of the limelight, get his family, and go on a vacation. So they went to the 
the Adirondack camp at the base of Mount Marcy with his wife Edith, two of their sons and his party. They walked about, hiked about halfway up the next day. Edith and the kids turned around. Uh, the vice president and his party proceeded to, to the top of Mount Marcy, which is the highest peak in the Adirondack. On the way back on the shore of the Lake of the Clouds, which is the headwaters of the Hudson River, they were having lunch. And the messenger came uh, with a telegram summoning Roosevelt to Buffalo immediately. Uh, the president had taken the turn to the work. Roosevelt got to Buffalo uh, to be sworn in as the 26th president of the United States. <coughs> that night just came totally out of the blue. Uh, we look at some of the history uh, prior to that time. As a governor of New York, Roosevelt had the troublesome tendency of wanting to protect national natural resources and rein in corporate greed. Uh, they had to figure out a way to get this bull out of their china shop. <laughs> the answer was, let's draft him for the vice president. He <laughs> <laughs> never does anything as vice president. And then the Republican Party chairman, Mark Hanna, said, now that damn cowboy is in the White House. <laughs> Imagine having a president today who would take time out at noon for ornithological reading. <laughs> Imagine a governor of Montana that's a soil scientist. <laughs> Jefferson that the White House had had someone so well versed in the sciences as um, Theodore Roosevelt. And we think about the tremendous legacy that he leaves. Uh, 250 million acres of national forest, national wildlife refuges, identifying or defining uh, the word conservation itself uh, that's so important. The nation's wild places have become as much of our character as Gettysburg battlefields, as Constitution Hall as the Liberty Belt, as Plymouth Rock. Then why has protecting our wild places become such a political football? Those who support uh, clean air, clean water, are labeled as liberals. Those who want to save the few ancient forests remaining for their aesthetic qualities, the repository of biodiversity, our anti-development environmental wackos. Wasn't it Republican President Abraham Lincoln, the first president, to set aside land for aesthetic value? He signed a document on July 1st, 1864, either the Civil War, conveying the Mariposa Grove of those giant sequoias to the state of California for recreation. A hundred years later, Lyndon Johnson, another president not known as a conservation, <coughs> signed the Wilderness Act. At that time, that bill passed the House 372 to 12 and the Senate 92 to 1. What would happen today? <laughs> Richard Nixon, no liberal by any account, uh, worked in a bipartisan fashion, created the the Clean Air Act Amendment, extended the Endangered Species Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, Coastal Zone Management Act, and extended the National Park System. Theodore Roosevelt said this, a nation that destroys the soil destroys itself. And he hadn't read W.C. Lauderdale. <laughs> And if Roosevelt were alive today, I think he'd add to that. I think he'd say a nation that destroys its soil, its water, and its biodiversity destroys itself. So let's go back to this security theme and say if we really, truly want to be free from threats to our security, we really need to think long haul about <coughs> land, our relationship with the land. And as we spend billions of dollars lives, you know, and hours, uh, going after those that need to be gone after, like Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, 
Uh, let me say, though, aren't we making a mistake by putting almost all of our energy in that sphere and ignoring the threats to the land, uh, the education, uh, our ability to produce food, water over the long haul, things that have toppled more civilization uh, than all the desperate, the desperate dictators put together. And ask ourselves, uh, are we truly going to be secure if our borders are sealed off from terrorists, if our water isn't pure, if our air isn't pure, and if the land we live on is losing its productivity, it become sick? I think the answer to that question is on the TV every day as we look at Iraq and Baghdad. And the answer is blown in the sand. I'll do one for all present. Have a wonderful meeting and thank you for the invitation to speak.
to provide the job. Because plain and simple, a lot of the spinning and fuel treatment is nothing more than, I mean, it's, it's labor intensive work and it needs to be done. And we can prescribe burns very much without doing uh, some yeah. kind of fuel reduction first in, in much of what we have to deal with. So in that sense, Yes, are they trading off natural resource programs for other things? In fact, uh, we have been losing market share in conservation in the United States for a long time. And that's that if we take a look at the proportion of the federal budget allocated to natural resources and conservation today versus 40 years ago, it's, uh, it's, it's not a, a good story at all. So we're losing ground to other values and somehow we've got to get that back. And to me, it's, all boils down to our relationship and understanding of what the importance of the land and what it does for us in general as a society. And somehow we seem to be losing that.
this question is up to me. People want to build there and they're here. <laughs> Amen. Help us with that. <laughs> Uh, yes, actually, they can. Um, yeah. You're on screen. Yeah, I'll uh, give them the protocol here uh, quickly. I'm going to go ahead and shut the door because there are some conferences going on next door. We don't want to have a call on here. But it's unlocked, right? Kathy's <laughs> here. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> she made it. I called. I know that. <laughs> yeah, um, just a few quick things. Um, your microphones, if you touch them once, the red light will come on. That means the mic is open <coughs> and it'll send your audio, um, touch it again, the red light will go out, and that means nothing's going out from your microphone. Um, you want to leave them off until you actually have something to say that you want everybody to hear. Um, if you're addressing Professor Dombeck, you want to look directly at him and talk to him. If you're saying something to people in Stevens Point, you want to look at those cameras right up above the big screen. Any questions? Sounds like somebody turned on their mic by accident on either end. Yeah. Hi, Hi, shall guys. we get started? Are we getting started? Mike, would you like me to give a little orientation? Well, uh, yes, Ron, would you please do that? Thanks for uh, helping out. Sure. I've I'll... got Rich here at the Pile Center that's doing sort of the same here. Okay, great. I was just running through some of the students here, as you can see. Let's see. We do have a, a fairly good house here. Uh, Let's see, I think we got two, four, six, eight students here uh, filling the second and third rows. And I was just going on to begin to explain what it is to take one of these classes. Let me just give you a little background real quick on something here. And I'm going to put up a document camera. And you might be able to see this a little bit, but if you, it looks like the state of Wisconsin with a lot of spaghetti thrown on top of it. What those lines represent are all of the connections and lines that go out through the state to connect what we call networks or interactive networks. And this represents what is called bad, the BadgerNet Full Motion Video Network. 
And right now, where we're going from is, let's see, do I have a pen or a pencil? No, I don't, so I'm going to use my finger. We're here, approximately in this area where my finger is, and Michael Dombeck is down here at the pile center. So we're being routed through uh, leased lines or fiber lines in order to carry an interactive video and audio teleconference between here and the Pile Center in Madison. This allows uh, Dr. Dombeck to be able to teach his class from the Pile Center to the students here. Now, none of these people here told me they had ever taken a class like this, so I'm just going to give you a brief orientation. One is, it's a class. This is not television. This is a class, and you conduct yourself the same way as you would in any class. We have TVs, we have cameras. As you can see here, we have a student camera up in this area, and I'll go to the student camera. We have a student camera that's picking you up. We have an instructor camera as well that picks the instructor up when the instructor's at this desk. Now, when the instructor is not here, what we have is, let's see if I can pick him up sitting over here way off to my side. Oops, he's on the other side. This is Steve. And Steve is one of our student facilitators, and he will be running the panel that I have in front of me and serving as a facilitator during this class. If uh, Dr. Dombeck wants to pick up a particular student, you can't hide, by the way, from this. This is one of those technologies that no matter how far back you sit in the room, we can always find you by a camera. So you can't, you can't get out of it. Uh, and that's what his purpose is here. He also is here to, in case we do have any glitches or we have interruptions, he then begins to troubleshoot them from our end, as well as the people at Pile Center do kind of the same thing. You have microphones in front of you. We, you have to be, in order to be able to be interactive and answer questions and participate in conversations with students on that end or Dr. Dombach and vice versa, you have to have a microphone. You don't need to talk loud into these microphones. You can talk just the same way as you would with your normal voice. And there's one microphone for every two students. So if that microphone is kind of between you, as you are over there, you can probably aim it closer to you a little bit. Uh, all you have to do to talk is push to talk on these. Am I right, Steve? Okay, good. I want to check on that because we switch these around for different classes and for, for different distance ed rooms. Now, what that means is you've got a little bar in front of you, and when you push that down and hold it down, all you have to do is talk. Let's try it from one of you two here. Which one wants to volunteer and just give your name and where you're from here? My name is Peter. Okay. I'm from Stevens Point. Thank you, Peter. And that's a good way to do that. Uh, Sometimes these are, this is just going to be two-way between here and the Pile Center. Sometimes we have as many as eight places, and eight sites on a teleconference. And what we ask students to do then is just identify who they are and where they're, where they're from. So uh, you may be Jill from Stevens Point or uh, Ralph from Madison. And that helps identify who you are and where you're coming from, and that helps us a great deal. The one thing we ask students to make sure that they do when they're in these classrooms is be proactive as students. If you can't see something or if you haven't heard something, because sometimes a student will not, won't hold the bar down for the entire question. They'll let it up in the middle and it will kind of come out like and like that. And you will break it up and you say, I didn't hear that. It didn't get across me. Could you repeat the question? Or I didn't hear what the student said. Have them repeat it. Ask so you don't lose any information. If there's visuals that are put up, they're a little hard for you to see or you can't get them, ask. Don't just sit there and suffer in silence and then turn in lousy evaluations at the end of this whole thing and say, this was just terrible. We couldn't see or hear anything. So be proactive. You are not watching television. You are not on television. There is, granted, a certain amount of self-consciousness when you first start out with some of these because you can see the students at the other end, and you can, they can see you. But after a while, take my word for it, it goes away. It's just like a normal class. And the television idea and the idea of watching television, you're on television, leaves very, very quickly. And you'll begin to concentrate on the content, and you will get into the lesson very quickly. Uh, I don't have a whole lot more to tell you. Those are pretty much basic uh, things. If you need to talk to the instructor after class, one is is this has a set scheduled time. And I believe, Mike, do we go to 3 o'clock? Uh, we'll go to uh, 2.50. Okay, to 2.50.
So if you have questions afterwards and maybe something hasn't been covered, you may have to find another route to be able to talk to him. You may have to talk with your instructor to see if is there a telephone that you can get to to call him later, maybe email address or something like that and you can use because at 3 o'clock uh, the network will move to another class that comes on from another place at 3 o'clock. Anybody have any questions? Great. I hope you have fun. I hope it's a great class, Mike. It's all yours. Oh, thanks, Ron. Thanks for the orientation. And uh, by the way, I'll be here till 3, uh, but I know some, some of you either at Stevens Point or here might have other classes, and the, the scheduled time is from, from 2 to 2.50. But uh, uh, this should be uh, uh, issues in global conservation, uh, natural resources, uh, 796 if you're in Stevens Point, and if you're here in Madison, it should be environmental studies, 900. And... Uh, I'll, a lot of today uh, will be logistics, um, but not all of it. And, and what I'll say is I think uh, we've had a room change here, and, and perhaps not all of the people are here yet. Uh, so what I'll want you to do next week is we'll sort of do a little bit of an introduction of what, what you're working on for grad students' projects. Uh, Miriam, are you uh, back from Mexico? Are you there in point yet? I guess... Um, Miriam Wyman's not back yet, but at any rate, I was just talking with uh, uh, Kathy Gonzalez here and uh, as a graduate student, and she just got back from Mexico working on an uh, issue uh, in forestry, uh, social issues with uh, the transition of a community from uh, sustainable agriculture or subsistence agriculture to logging. And uh, Miriam's working on um, sort of a transition from a subsistence situation to ecotourism. So I think there perhaps uh, we can make some connections there because that's really the objective is uh, uh, for us to get to know one another better and try to get a little bit more comfortable with this technology. This is my first time at it. And uh, if any of you are going to end up in a classroom like this, I can guarantee you this is what you're going to be doing as opposed to what I did. Uh, the, the chalkboard, I think, is a thing of the past, which is okay for me because I mean, my writing is, is terrible. But uh, let me just um, um, first uh, put up the um, – uh, uh, this is the um, web address that most of the material that I will cover today is on. Uh, so uh, I will just leave that up for a minute for you to write down. And um, any new material, the course schedule, my office hours, phone numbers, email, uh, the student roster as it stands now for both campuses is on is posted there. Um, so that's something that's uh, uh, the basic information uh, uh, that I'll cover today is uh, is on there. The second thing that I want to show you before we switch to uh, uh, the PowerPoint presentation is um, uh, this is issues in global conservation and, and basically. Uh, uh, and a seminar, a one-credit seminar, and you de you decide what issues you really want to focus on and analyze in detail because that's really the way it works in in the real world. Our objective is not to come up with some sort of a case and 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 uh, try to design some case. The objective is to have a uh, try to emulate a real-world situation as much as possible. And I uh, spent um, 25 years working for one federal agency or another, and. Uh, have got lots of scars from debates and hearings and uh, public meetings and uh, lots of fun, by the way, also. It's not all all bad. It's uh, at least 90 percent very, very positive. It's just those very few issues that are really tough uh, and really, really controversial, but those happen to be the ones that get all of the press and, and all of the visibility. But um, if you look at uh, uh, what I have here on the overhead, uh, what I'm going to be talking about the next couple of class sessions are the issues that I think are important. And uh, uh, they both basically focus around public land. And, I, and what we've got is a read-only a PDF file. Of uh, I'm in a process uh, with a couple of colleagues of just finishing up a book called uh, um, From Conquest to Conservation. That would be the second item here. And, uh, Chapter one, that's in draft at this point yet. It's in to the editors, but that basically describes the context of public land. And it's only about 15 pages or so. And if, if you, uh, I won't take the time to explain what the Bureau of Land Management is, what the Forest Service is, uh, how they evolved, uh, those that say give the land back, what is the constitutional basis for the fact that all the people in the United States own the public land. Um, um, 
So that's all uh, listed in this chapter. And then uh, uh, the upper one, it says the Big Ten Public uh, Land Conservation Challenges for a New Century. Um, what that will be will be a text of a conservation lecture that I gave at Berkeley uh, not too long ago. I gave an earlier version of it, uh, both at Stevens Point and um, uh, here at Madison, uh, and it's, it's changed significantly since the uh, oral version that uh, some of you may have heard if you uh, attended that colloquium or seminar. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's go ahead and go to the PowerPoint. Um, and uh, just quickly go over some of the uh, uh, objectives. My computer's got to wake up here. Um, now, those of you at point, uh, go ahead and um, it's doing what I thought it might do, Rich. Uh, the, um, well, I just need to go to next. Can you tell which one is next on there? Is it the top one? I go to the next slide, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, good. Well, hopefully that won't happen again. If not, uh, one of you, did you s tell me how to do that, Kathy, or was it? Yeah. Andrea told me how to, you might have to come up here and run this. Um, the, uh, the, the objectives and, and what I hope uh, that you get out of this, and this is, um, let me just move over a little bit so I'm not right in the line of view of this uh, overhead here. Um, Number one is to uh, acquire an understanding of selected conservation issues. Uh, I'm going to go over the next couple of classes. I'm going to go over ten issues in a not an in-depth but sort of a common sense way uh, because that's the way the public views issues. Uh, and uh, when you're dealing in the public policy arena, you're going to have to explain very technical issues and, and sometimes very simple ways. And, uh, I think it was Senator Hayakawa from California some years ago that said he got his Ph.D. and it took him uh, three years to get over it. He had to relearn how to communicate so people could understand him. Um, uh, and the issues that you'll be working on, um, you pick. Uh, we'll focus a little bit upon improving your skills in policy analysis. Uh, and, of course, then we'll do a, a short verbal presentation and a short written presentation. So I sort of summarize these objectives as uh, the first one is uh, what are the issues, uh, the policy analysis is what are we going to do about them, and then the, the third and fourth objectives are how do we communicate what we want to do about them. And um, uh, what you'll be doing, and the first one here is by far the hardest, and that's selecting a specific issue or segment of a larger issue uh, for some sort of in-depth analysis. Uh, and we'll talk about a lot more about that later. But, but in essence, uh, uh, I think it was Aldo Leopold that said, um, instead of learning more and more about less and less, we need to learn more about the entire biotic community. And in, a, in an essence, uh, most of the education that most of us and probably you've had, you know, your entire career has been sort of analyzing specific details about specific issues, the physiology of an animal or a plant or a microhabitat or a specific land use issue or whatever it might have been. Now, how do we put all this together? So our, the scope of, of this seminar is to sort of reverse that and take it into a, a, a macro direction. So, you know, what if you're chairman of the Senate uh, Resources Committee? What issues are you going to move forward? You know, what if you're a Secretary of Agriculture? Chief of the Forest Service, head of the Bureau of Land Management, uh, Secretary of the Interior, what issues are you going to move forward from that platform, and then how are you going to move them forward? How do you segment an issue to communicate it to the public so that they understand it? All of those kinds of things is sort of the, the approach we'll come at this from. Um, review the policy options and make policy recommendations for a specific, <coughs> for a specific issue. Um, again, uh, how do you segment an issue and communicate it to a skeptical public, a biased public, a proactive public? Uh, how do you sell it to a legislative body? How do you sell it to the employees in an organization? Uh, how do you communicate it? Uh, that's really uh, what we want to focus on here. And then the uh, um, 
and we'll talk more about that soon. And then uh, to give a 15 to 30 minute oral presentation and write a less than 800 word briefing paper on uh, what that issue is that you select. Uh, in the third, in three weeks, the third class session is when we will, as a group, select and decide what issue, specific issue you will work on. And my objective here is to, uh, sometime between now and the end of the next class period, I'll talk about 10 issues. And uh, you can pick one of those 10. Uh, you can pick um, almost any kind of issue that you want. Uh, if you want to work in teams, uh, that's fine. Uh, it's it's uh, because sometimes, you know, various interests get together and gang up on the opposition as they move issues forward. So all, all of any of that is really, uh, really okay with me. Now, from the standpoint of the briefing paper, uh, and this will come in, in April, is basically all we want is a summary of the issue, uh, what our op a background, what our options are, and what you recommend. Now, uh, my, my experience in working in the agencies has been fascinating. If, if you go to the research section, you know, for example, I, the Forest Service has about 33,000 employees, uh, about half of the natural resources research capacity in the United States. If I, as chief, would ask a group of scientists for a briefing paper on some issue, they really had a tough time writing it. They would give me all the technical jargon, and uh, then I have to send that briefing paper either to the White House or to the Senate or to the House of Representatives or to the, sec the, the cabinet member of the secretary, and that, that doesn't work. Oftentimes, I would find somebody that was a major in communications, liberal arts, or English, and say, "Hey, do a do a briefing paper on uh, uh, the impacts of uh, of uh, clear cutting on the Rogue River National Forest," and send it to the and I'd get a two pager that was very clear, concise, to the point, uh, with some recommendations in it, and, and that's that's what we're going to try to do here. Uh, with uh, the written part of it, and then of course the the oral presentation is you're going to have to convince us that your recommendation is worth considering. Uh, so again, uh, we live in a world of sound bites. In fact, my daughter, who's a senior at Virginia Tech in biology and chemistry this year, just took a communications class and she said, now a sound bite, according to her professor, was about seven seconds. So we're, we're an impatient world. We don't want a lot of jargon. We don't want a lot of detail. We want, you know, just cut to the chase and what are my options and, and move forward from there. That's essentially uh, the objectives of what we're going to try to do. Any questions uh, before I go any further? Okay. Um, uh, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Uh, the, um, the grading, uh, fairly subjective. I'll be the first to admit that. Um, the, uh, my office hours at Stevens Point, uh, two to four on Tuesdays. Uh, I'll be here in Madison. Uh, I usually get here around 10 or 10.30. I live in Plover, which is just south of Stevens Point. So I'll have, uh, it's an open door from uh, 10.30 to 12, or we can meet just before class, uh, just set another time. And I'll be down here uh, uh, more than just the specific class times in Madison as well. I'm on too many committees from the Wisconsin Academy of Sciences to other kinds of things, so I get down to Madison fairly often. Um, in Stevens Point, uh, you all know where you are, College of Professional Studies 104, we're at the Pyle Center here in Madison, only we're not in room 312, but Rich, we will be next week, right? I hope so. Yeah, yeah there were some, apparently some technical problems with 312, so um, uh, we're in 327 today, and, and hopefully those that aren't here will... Um, get caught up, be sure to let them know the website and stuff so they can uh, they can catch up with, with where we are. Um, this is what I'm going to talk about, but first let me just uh, uh, get the, the names of who's here. Now, just one person walked in that I didn't. Okay, Todd, I've heard about you. Where are you from? Ames, hey. I spent some time, in, some time at Iowa State. Uh, let's just quickly go around the table there. Uh, 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 at Stevens Point, um, uh, Brian? Here. Okay, Brian. Uh, Melinda? Yeah, it's Mindy. It's Mindy? Okay. The uh, 
Uh, the video screen that I'm seeing isn't quite clear enough to make out exactly who you are, even if I, I've met some of you, and that's my excuse for blindness. Uh, uh, Peter Brown said he was there, right, from Stevens Point. Uh, Jim, I got an email from you. You found the place. Good. Amy? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, Amy. Betsy? Yep, here. Okay, Michelle? Here. Gotcha, okay. Julie? Here. Okay, and Miriam must still be in Mexico if she's not there. Okay, excellent. Um, what I'm going to do now is um, uh, go over the, the Big Ten issues, and I'm going to do, we're going to try to get about four of them in today and leave about um, five minutes uh, for questions for everyone, and then I can stay till 3 o'clock uh, before we get cut off the air here. And, and let me just say uh, that most of what I'm going to say is already on the web. It's written down. You don't have to uh, write it down. We just want to sort of just sort of talk about stuff and tell a few stories about, about issues. Oh, I forgot one, one really important point, and this is, uh, I guess, put it down for, for part of your assignment. Uh, we're going to go over the schedule next week, and uh, uh, it may change depending upon what your schedules are, because basically the plan is, is we're going to have four 50-minute sessions like today, so today and three more. Um, I've tried to schedule them so we have three weeks in a row, so you can make sure you know exactly where you want to go on, on your assignment and your analysis of your issue. And uh, then uh, about mid-March, we'll meet just to sort of visit about a, you have questions, uh, uh, logistical things as a group so we can make sure that, uh, I mean, part of the discussing these issues and this is what I'm working on and I'm having problems and, and that kind of thing. And then the last two sessions we'll have, uh, I've, I've put the dates and the times down uh, as much as a placeholder. But I thought what we'd do is we'd do, we'd have some fun and get out. Uh, and, and one of the places, if you haven't been, uh, you'll go, and that's to, to the shack. Uh, and we'll, um, we'll spend some time. Half of you will do your presentations at the shack, and then we'll go for an afternoon hike and talk about where the good oak was. And uh, if it's a nice day, maybe Nina Leopold Bradley, uh, Alda Leopold, uh, one of his daughters, will come out with us. Uh, she, I'm, I'm on the Leopold Foundation board, so I've got a, a little bit of an in in with them, or else uh, Buddy Huffaker, the, um, uh, the director of the Leopold Foundation or somebody. And, th and that leaves a second Saturday, uh, which uh, I was thinking of, uh, we could go to the Muir Farm and do the same thing. Uh, we could go to the Badger Munitions Plant. Uh, I mean, there's different, so, so think about where we might want to go for that second Saturday session. And we'll uh, we'll get that tied down hopefully next week, if not next week, the week after. And uh, I know a couple of people. One person emailed me, and they have a wedding. It seems to me that's pretty important. Uh, so we'll we'll figure out uh, if uh, you have a, a life and death or marriage situation that you can't make one of the Saturdays. Uh, we'll figure something out, uh, but we're going to make you pay uh, okay. for not being being part of it in some way. So uh, be sure to take take a look at this web page and then take a look at your calendars and um, we'll see what adjustments we can make. And uh, if, if everybody agrees that you'd rather do it on a Sunday or you have a Friday or a weekday, that's okay with me. I'm probably one of the more flexible people since I don't have uh, the class schedules that you have. So take a look at the dates and locations, uh, uh, the dates, and come up with ideas for a second place uh, we might want to go. We could get Kurt Miney, for example, to do a... a, a a session on um, tell us what's going on at the Badger, Badger Munitions Plant and all the negotiations there would be an idea of something we could do. As I said, there's there's lots of places. And I'm, I'm trying to pick places that are sort of halfway between here and Stevens Point, so it makes it easier uh, for us to, um, uh, to meet. And hopefully we'll have bright, sunny days that are warmer than today. Okay, the Big Ten. Um, this is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I selected the Big Ten, and I've been giving some talks around the country and stuff on, on these issues. Uh, and my objective is to try to get people engaged in conservation. Uh, 
keep issues at the forefront because that's the way issues get resolved. And there's a lot of background noise. I mean, we've got September uh, 11th, that's uh, terrorism, anthrax, uh, all kinds of things are making headlines. And one of the concerns is, well, that this has given one segment an opportunity to sort of, you know, make some changes and fiddle with policy uh, while they're not on the front page of the newspaper, which they typically would be. So has conservation moved from the front page to the back page? And, and uh, one of the things I've been doing is talking about issues that I think are important and uh, writing about them. And um, uh, the, the speech that I have, the text of it is posted on that website for you to take a look at. But um, uh, I'll just say that uh, these are my issues, two issues that are very, very important that I don't talk about are population growth and global warming, and they're both very, very complex, very, very controversial, uh, uh, difficult to make policy changes, national or international policy changes uh, on those issues. But uh, uh, the first one um, I'll mention, uh, if I get this, uh, okay, we need to go the other way. Um, is um, uh, let me just say a few words about uh, this introduction here. Uh, think about, uh, I talked about maybe some role playing, but think about the role of the executive branch uh, uh, and how they can elevate and surface issues. Obviously, the president can make an, uh, uh, an issue a priority. Uh, when I was in the Forest Service, Bill Clinton got interested in roadless. He got interested in national monuments. Uh, uh, Herbert Hoover was president. He designated national monuments. Teddy Roosevelt started the, the National Wildlife Refuge System, uh, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Wilderness Act, all those kinds of things. There's an, those are major, major national policy changes. A significant thing has happened um, since about 1970 in U.S. politics as it uh, pertains to conservation, and that's that the judicial branch of government has gotten involved. And for those of you that are in really into the resource management, you, you need to ask yourself the question of why. Why was it that before about 1960 or 1970, it was the congressional branch, the legislative branch, funded the agencies, passed some legislation, and the executive branch implemented that legislation, you know, like the chief of the Forest Service, the Secretary of Interior, the uh, they all work essentially work for the uh, the executive branch or the president. But but for some reason, the judicial branch got involved starting about 1970. And a lot of natural resource policy today is evolving from case law. And I've got to tell you that uh, if, if you've got a bent toward law and you're really interested in conservation, it's not a bad way to have an influence because uh, uh, the role that environmental lawyers play today is very, very significant. And yet, 40 years ago, they had almost no role. Um, I keep on hitting the uh, back instead of the front one. Okay. The um, first issue that I want to talk about is, um, is mining law. And uh, it's, I use this as an example, and it's not a big issue here in Wisconsin. But it's probably one of the most vexing laws uh, and the oldest law on the books. You know, think about 1872, uh, women couldn't vote. Uh, the country was still reeling from the Civil War. Uh, to a, lar a large part of the country, St. Louis was the western, marked the western frontier. And uh, uh, the mining law was a law that was written by miners for miners. Uh, um, so much pressure was put on the United States uh, that wasn't prepared to deal with with mining, and uh, that's sort of how we got to where we are uh, uh, with mining law. The uh, interesting thing with mining law, and uh, much of what I said is on the, um, uh, on the PowerPoint there, is that uh, the royalty provisions are antiquated. It's basically a giveaway of public resources. Uh, many people have tried to change it. Uh, since about 1940, but you and I are all owners of the gold that's under the federal lands, the, uh, uh, the silver, uh, the other hard rock minerals, and uh, foreign and multinational corporations pay no royalty. Uh, in addition to that, it, they mandate privatization of public land for about $250 to $5 an acre. 
I don't know if you recall seeing, you know, Bruce Babbitt would have the greatest heist since Jesse James as he tried to elevate the fact that he was having to sign, as Secretary of Interior, he had the authority and the responsibility to, to sign the deed giving the mining company the federal land. And, of course, he had to do it because it was required by law, but he always objected. Uh, and uh, again, you see uh, 250 to five dollars an acre. That's basically um, uh, 1872 prices. And but the most significant difference uh, and thing with the 1872 mining law is the last point on the screen there, and that's that uh, every other resource use on public land, whether it's timber, grazing, oil and gas, uh, recreation, uh, building a trail, go through a National Environmental Policy Act process, and um, a field level manager, a professional resource manager, makes the decision whether or not that project should move forward or not, based upon environmental and public safety reasons, all except mining. Just like the Secretary of Interior, pair of the 1872 mining law has got to sign that deed, uh, 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 giving that land to the mining company. Uh, the mining company then mines it, and we have one, one situation that made the press where uh, uh, land was sold for about $17,000 an acre after they did a little bit of mining there. It's not, uh, I, want, I don't want to make this sound like a complete free-for-all because we're all going to want to go out and, and get federal land and, you know, and resell it or something. Uh, the mining company does have to prove that there's a mineable deposit there. It has to go through an assessment, but the only requirement is that it has to be economic for them to do it. And obviously, if it wasn't, why would they do it? Uh, they, they are not there just passing uh, the time away. Um, several attempts to change uh, the mining law have occurred in uh, uh, Stuart Udall, who was Secretary of the Interior under Kennedy and Johnson, left office after his eight-year term and basically said, look, this was the last major natural resources law that we really need to change. And um, in the uh, Clinton administration, the early years of the Clinton administration, there was an interesting dynamic. Uh, there was dialogue, well, should we take on grazing, or does Bruce Babbitt and others take on grazing or mining, or how do we do this? Well, one of the things they did is took grazing on first, and, and that was a major tactical error uh, because it refocused all of the political entities, the lobbyists, the conflict industry. Uh, the timber and the mining lobbyists started donating money to the grazing lobbyists uh, because their whole objective was to keep them busy. Because if they could keep them busy on grazing, they wouldn't have time to take on other issues. So there's all sorts of things like that that happen in a democracy. And I'm not implying this is bad. I'm just saying that's sort of the way, the way it is. But at any rate, uh, by the the time that uh, uh, the, con the two-year congressional session was near to an end, uh, and that would have been about October of 1990, September, October of 1993. Almost all of the issues surrounding the revision of the 1872 mining law had been resolved. Uh, Congressman Ray Hall from West Virginia was the chairman of the, of the subcommittee that dealt with it. Uh, a couple of minor issues went unresolved. Congress adjourned and it all went by the wayside uh, because what happened in the 93 election is the, the House and the Senate both switched from, from Democrat to Republican. Uh, Clinton was bleeding from a variety of, or hemorrhaging from a variety of, of other issues and uh, the Republican Congress just did not want to take on mining law and so it, it goes unresolved uh, as a result of that. Uh, it's a, a, the staying issue of uh, the 1872 mining law is what's absolutely phenomenal. If you look at it from the standpoint of logic, uh, common sense, uh, it's a no-brainer. But yet, uh, uh, the question is, so, you know, how do we change it? Uh, uh, why do members, some, enough members of Congress support not changing the 1872 mining law that they somehow uh, seem to be able to block it? I want to talk a little bit about wildland fire another issue, so this would be my issue number two on the list. And uh, there's some interesting things uh, uh, associated with wildland fire. 
and that's that, uh, and we're going to talk about education next week, <coughs> that the, the Smoky Bear uh, public education campaign uh, was the most successful conservation education campaign uh, ever, in probably in the history, certainly in the history of the U.S., probably in the history of the world. And in 1968, uh, more people knew who Smokey was than knew who the president was. Pretty phenomenal. Uh, Smokey was the second most commonly recognized character uh, in the United States. And no, Mickey wasn't one. It was Santa Claus. Uh, so the now the challenge for those of us that are interested in conservation is how do we recreate this in uh, in other issues? This level of awareness that that inner city kids. Uh, Kids that grow up in poverty, uh, kids that grow up in wealth, most of them seem to know who Smokey was and uh, uh, phenomenal uh, education campaign. The thing uh, that we find with uh, Wildland Fire is, um, um, and it's, it's more, much more of a problem, just like mining law in the Inner Mountain West or in arid areas uh, than it is here in Wisconsin, but the fire season is very predictable uh, if you're a firefighter. It starts in Florida about now, uh, and it goes from Florida, uh, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Texas, uh, and then it starts in Southern California, March, February, late February, March. It moves into uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and then it starts moving north up the spine of the Rockies, uh, the Inner Mountain West, uh, the Cascades, and by the time we hit August and September, it's ending in uh, Montana and Idaho in a typical year, so it, it, it's very uh, uh, predictable. What uh, the, the key situation with fire is that um, uh, we were so good at fighting fires and we took it so seriously and Smokey did such a good job that we taught the world that all fire was bad. And then lo and behold about 1970 or so we began to realize that fire was a natural part of the ecosystem, that it was a cleansing agent like wind and water and that uh, uh, the chaparral and most forests evolved with fire. Uh, if they, they were adapted to fire, if they w weren't, they wouldn't be there. And what was new on the landscape was us and our houses that weren't adapted to fire. And uh, uh, our challenge now is, as a society is to reverse that. And we've got the best wildland firefighters in the world, and we've been putting out fires for 100 years. And there's a graph of uh, the acres burned uh, from 19, actually about 1910 uh, to 2000. And... Uh, the early data is, um, is not real accurate, but um, uh, there were estimates. But 1910 was the milestone year uh, for fire. And that was the year that the United States of America declared all-out war on wildland fire because we had a terrible, terribly dry year, lots of acres burned. It was sort of like 1871, which was the year of the Peshtigo fire when uh, uh, the Peshtigo fire in Wisconsin remains to be the worst wildland fire in history where about 1,500 people died. And that year, in, uh, just in the northern Wisconsin and the upper peninsula of Michigan and northern Minnesota, about 3.7 million acres burned. And there were slash fires after logging. A lot of them were intentionally set and escaped. Uh, so if you look at the graph there, you see about nine, by 19, the 1920s, 1930s, uh, we really got our firefighting machinery in the United States in, in shape. By 1940s, we were deploying smoke jumpers to put out fires in, in the back country. Uh, all this time, fuel is accumulating. And if your natural fire cycle was every seven years, if you were in the Chaparral, or maybe every 30 years, if you were some mid-elevation in the Inner Mountain West, uh, we were still effective at putting out fires. And today, our wildland firefighters put out about 98% of the fires in initial attack. Good job market, by the way, for summer people. Uh, they're the, both the BLM Forest Service, all the agencies are, are hiring firefighters like gangbusters because most of the... Uh, it's another topic, but the, the age demographics of a lot of the federal agency and state agency employees is that many of them are ready to retire uh, or close to it. So uh, the, if you're looking for summer work uh, and you're interested in firefighting, uh, the job market for that is good. I'm amazed with people like smoke jumpers. Uh, uh, you see people from almost every walk of life, and they sort of get addicted to that lifestyle. And uh, there's a lot of teachers, professors, uh, various people that are involved in firefighting. Um, 
we've got to somehow communicate to the American public that we need to put fire back on the land. How do we do that? How do we suddenly convince, you know, we know fire is dangerous. A tremendous natural resources conservation challenge that we have in this country. The second one associated with fire is the urban wildland interface. Everybody wants their 10 acres on the mountainside. So now what we have is we've got an urban wildland interface and subdivisions and developments backed right up to fire prone uh, ecosystems and they're up and down the, the east slope, up and down the west slope, they're uh, in the Bitterroots, they're in the Cascade Range, uh, around Lake Tahoe, three, four, five, six hundred thousand dollar homes and uh, they're expecting those homes to be protected and if their house burns they're mad. Uh, the cost of structural firefighting is high. It's very, very different than wildland firefighting. Some of the concerns that people have are uh, air quality and smoke. Uh, we want to prescribe fire in public lands and national forests or BLM lands, and yet a rice farmer in the Central Valley of California can't get a permit to burn his rice field. Tremendous communications challenge. Uh, a wheat farmer in, in Eastern Washington can't burn his field, but yet we want to. We say, hey, we've got to burn uh, this forested, prescribe, apply prescribed fire to these forested landscapes. <coughs> How do you explain that to them so they accept it or understand it? Because the, the bottom line is, uh, it's going to burn either with us or without us. And uh, the year 2000 was an exceptionally bad year uh, because of the drought conditions and. Uh, so do you want to take that, even though EPA regulates air quality and smoke, uh, when it's a natural fire, uh, the regulator is somebody else. And uh, a big challenge uh, associated with that. I'll go ahead and go back to the, uh, uh, how do we get society to accept fire? I just wanted to tell a, uh, a, a little story about Bill Clinton. Um, president Clinton was the only president to ever go on a fire. And uh, I was, um, uh, out west, almost all year, the year 2000 was a real bad fire season. Uh, we had spent, a, the Forest Service alone had spent a billion dollars fighting wildland fire. Now just think if we could take a billion dollars and do in an education campaign or training or whatever that rather than apply it in the emergency room when there's an emergency, if we could do it in a proactive way uh, at, at any rate. Uh, Bill Clinton decides he's going to go on a fire. Uh, the phone rings. I'm out in Montana, and the White House wants to, us to do advance to get ready for the president to go on the fire. So we had, well, obviously there's got to be fires where we take him. And our choices were Nevada, California, Idaho, and Montana. And um, where is he going to go? Well, California, of course. There's 54 electoral votes. There's an election coming up in November. The guy's a great showman. I mean, he's he is the the, the master of uh, of uh, communications and and uh, uh, the master politician. Well, as it ended up, he decided to come to Idaho. And the fascinating thing with that part of it was is the senior senator from Idaho, Larry Craig, who was chairman of the Public Lands Committee at that time, disliked President Clinton so much he didn't go to the State of the Union address for the last two years. Well, they come out to Idaho, and who gets off of Air Force One behind Bill Clinton but Larry Craig? And it was almost a love in. But uh, <coughs> uh, the other uh, interesting thing with uh, Clinton's selection of going to Idaho was the fact that, uh, you know, there probably isn't one person in 100, a radius of 100 miles that voted for him because, uh, you know, it's, it's very, Idaho is very anti Fed. Uh, there's a lot of public land there. They didn't like Bill Clinton. Uh, and yet, uh, to see, it was just a fascinating experience to be able to see him operate in an environment like that. And uh, everybody that he came in contact with him would have voted for him. It, it, that was the skill that he had. And, and we could tell a lot of stories about Bill Clinton. But at any rate, the bottom line as a result of that fire, and uh, we flew the fire, uh, talked a lot about fire. He had a lot of questions. He took a nap, ate a banana, ate a bagel said he'd rather go on a vacation in National Forest, but Chelsea liked to go to Nantucket because she had friends there, and uh, it's just, you know, very uh, informed. Uh, but one of the things that always amazed me with uh, 
President Clinton is when he got engaged in an issue, he really got engaged and he really knew the details. I mean, you know, he read everything from fire safety manuals to he was conversant in the language, which was, I think, very, very unusual for somebody with his kind of workload and responsibility. The, the result of that trip was that um, when the president goes someplace, he's either got to have a signing ceremony or some kind of public event or something, and what he did was he, uh, uh, as a result of that, the Forest Service and other agencies, we got our biggest budget increase in history, uh, uh, going from 3.3 billion to 4.4, which is just absolutely phenomenal. And um, um, the uh, the reason that I think that's uh, phenomenal is because uh, uh, it was just two years before that that the Congress was threatening to cut the budget by to a custodial level because they didn't like the fact that we took on a road list. So, so here we are, uh, two years prior to the biggest budget increase in history, they say we're just going to cut you uh, to almost nothing. So uh, I'm going to stop there uh, for today. Uh, Will, I didn't, I'm, I had intended on going through the exotic species issue today, but we'll start there uh, next Wednesday, I'll be at Stevens Point. Uh, you'll be in room 312. If not, it will be posted, right, Rich? That's right. And uh, we will continue on with these issues. Think about your schedules and particularly the Saturday field trips so we can try to tie down the dates. Uh, those from Madison that missed the course, uh, be sure you, you know, give them the URL for the, if you know them. And uh, let me just stop and say, uh, are there any questions? First, from, let's go to Stevens Point since uh, uh, I know you've got to be out of that room sooner than we do here in Madison. Any questions at that end? Okay, uh, you should have everything. My email, um, did I see a hand go up back there? Yeah, you did. Um, I have a course conflict. Are these sessions taped at all, or is there any other way that I could stay in the class? Uh, you know, I'll have to, you've got a, a conflict with this time period. The, the, right, the class was canceled today, that's why I'm here, and I kind of want to still take both classes, and I was just curious if these sessions were taped or if there's any other way to uh, get around that conflict. You know, I, I, uh, I don't know if there's a way to tape them, so I guess just stay tuned. My guess is probably not, but... Um, since this is my first time doing this as well, I'm, uh, you know, not the ultimate expert in this. So uh, uh, why don't you send me an email, but and I'll do a little bit of checking tomorrow, and see if there's any way around that. Okay, I'll talk with my other instructor yeah, too. Now keep in mind that we're only going to be meeting here three more times, and it could be that you, you know, to if your other course it, that. There may be some accommodations at that end that could be made. Okay, I'll, I'll look into that. Good. Anything else there at point? Okay, we'll go out and enjoy the sunshine. Any questions here? Sure. Have a good week, by the way. Is the issue that we're going to be addressing for our project going to be the same throughout the class? No. Anybody, the uh, anybody can pick, you know, you can pick virtually virtually any issue you want. And, and as I said, I think that's going to be the hardest part of the whole class is to pick pick an issue that's workable, that's reasonable. And uh, it, it's, there's a lot of reasons I say that because it's the same in, uh, you know, when you're in the hot seat is when you take on an issue, the timing of an issue, is it ripe, is it premature, is it going to conflict with other issues, all those things come into play as the, uh, the decision-making machinery, the public opinion, how the press deals with it works. So uh, um, the, the smaller bites you take, the better. But the, uh, the thing that I think is important is that uh, the focus of, of this class is sort to sort of look at macro issues. And it's not to take a little tiny piece about what's going to happen on 40 acres and sort of ask yourself, if, OK, you're going to be Secretary of the Interior. What are you going to do? And how are you going to decide what you're going to do? Because, you know, people make those decisions all the time. If you're going to be chairman of the House Resources Committee or the Public Lands Committee, what are you going to do? What's your agenda going to be and, and, and how? 
you're going, going to approach it. So I would, I would ask yourself that set of questions as you think about, you know, an issue. I'll talk about roadless, you know, one that I was deeply involved in, roadless mm -hmm. on national forests and, and how it evolved. And I'll talk about that next week when we talk about another issue that's a big one in my book, and that's the fragmentation of our land, our landscape. Any other questions? Have a great week. I'll see you next Wednesday in uh, 104 College of Professional Studies. Thank you, Rich. Oh, no problem. Uh, it's a real honor for me to introduce our, our special guest and keynote speaker tonight. Of course, you all know that Michael Downbeck recently culminated a 22-year career in public land and wildlife management as chief of the United States Forest Service. But there's a lot more to that. And, then, and talking to him uh, before this, he wanted me to express that the, the proudest and most outstanding part of his career uh, was some years ago uh, where he spent 11 years as a fishing guide in northern Wisconsin where he grew up in a small town of about 1,500 people. And that's where I think you'll see his career being influenced very strongly from there because he has a real strong and long history as a fisheries biologist, having received a PhD in fisheries biology from Iowa State University. But I do have to say as a native of Iowa that Iowa State may be the Cyclones, but Iowa is the Hawkeye State. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but obviously, he's no dummy, even if he did go to Iowa State. <laughs> they don't give away PhDs over there, I know that for a fact. So, uh, But he did have, has, and continues to have a real long association with fisheries management, public lands management, in fact, 
uh, had risen up through the ranks to become a regional fisheries program manager for the Forest Service and then the national fisheries program manager for the entire Forest Service in the late 80s. Uh, during the 90s, among the posts he held, were acting director of the Bureau of Land Management, another large federal agency. And of course, as chief of the Forest Service, he didn't have very much responsibility. Uh, 33,000 employees, 192 million acres of national forests, and a $4.4 billion annual budget. So maybe he can give us some tips on how the Alliance can increase its budget. <laughs> but I think that uh, among the advancements really that we're all, that are near and dear to our hearts, and one of the reasons we're happy to have him here as a, a special guest and to share some of his wisdom with us is the profound impact that he had on the Forest Service and, and federal land management. He's, uh, as an individual, written and co-authored several scientific papers on fisheries management, aquatic watershed management, ecosystem management, and public lands. And uh, more importantly, uh, to my mind, and I think many of us as chief of the Forest Service, uh, took monumental steps to shift management of national forests to an ecological basis, which gives lots of opportunity for further improvements in the future, which I think most of us here would agree there is still plenty of room for improvement, but it laid the groundwork, uh, the groundwork or, and foundation of where we can advance and make those things possible. And some of the things that uh, he did also while at the Forest Service was revamp the accounting system. And under his leadership, for the first time in history, the Forest Service admitted it was losing money on timber sales. And we had uh, better accountability. And he did quite a bit of work with the Congress and the other branches of government to reestablish credibility at the Forest Service. So these are some big things that have been done uh, that have really, we've noticed the difference over the years. Of course, the, the roadless policy which emanated during his tenure and which we still have an opportunity to continue to shape and protect. So uh, we're real proud to have him here and please give a great reception to Mr. Michael Dunbar. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, with that introduction, I think I would be better off just not saying anything and going and sitting down. <laughs> but uh, it is uh, always uh, good for me to come back to Montana. And I, as I think about the wonderful opportunities I've had uh, my entire life, uh, Western Montana, uh, Northern Idaho have always been one of my very, very favorite places uh, in the world, along with uh, the Lake Country of Ontario and Northern Wisconsin, where I grew up. In fact, uh, Mike uh, said, well, uh, you know, send me your resume. What should I say about you? And I said, well, the only thing I really care that you say about me is that I spent 11 years as a fishing guide. Uh, because I think, really, uh, we think about how is it that we connect with nature. And I'll talk about that uh, in a little while, but uh, that was really you know, a tremendous opportunity for me to be out in nature in the, the beautiful lakes and rivers of the Shawamigan and Nicolay National Forest in northern Wisconsin. So then you say, well, how the heck does a, a guy like that end up in Washington, D.C.? And I, I wondered that myself. But there was one saving grace, and that's the, the, the chief's office in Washington, D.C., is within sight of the body of water that produced the U.S. record carp. <laughs> and uh, that's the tidal basin. And that is not a fish story. That was a 57-pounder caught in 1983. I, uh, I haven't perfected my carp fishing yet, but uh, I think it's a good thing to do. Uh, I'm going to try to perfect a little bit of trout fishing uh, on Saturday. Uh, so I'm, I'm really looking, looking forward to that. Um, I uh, applaud you for the theme of this uh, rendezvous, uh, making connections and protecting the core, uh, because uh, as a, uh, a federal employee and uh, for a long time, and uh, there's a lot of 
friends and, and colleagues of mine here in the audience. I see Bill out there, and Roger took care of me for a while, and Julia Ryber did lots of work, and uh, uh, others that are here that I may not have talked to. I just, just thank you for that. It's a, it's a tremendous, tremendous workforce uh, that we have. And I always talked about uh, the importance of going back to basics. So sometimes I think life is, is maybe a little bit too complicated, or we try to make it too complicated. And um, I think September 11 was a reminder of that for all of us. In fact, <laughs> September 11th, I believe, was the first time ever, it was for me, I know, and probably for most of you, a first time ever exper an experience. It was the first time that um, uh, we were really threatened on our turf uh, the way we were, and uh, deep emotions and deep feelings emanate from that. And uh, my hope is, is that we as Americans rally around this unifying point, that it isn't a flash like Desert Storm was, and that we, we rally to protect the core, the core of what's important to Americans, the core of what's important to all of us, uh, to protect our freedoms, uh, the freedom to move about, the freedom to do what we want to do, the freedom not to have to worry about our safety the safety of our families and friends. We need to rally around that point uh, to protect the core of our public lands, uh, the conservation agenda. We need to rally around that point because the quality of life depends upon that. Because you and I, as citizens of the United States, together own hundreds of millions of acres of land. This is our birthright. Our forefathers died securing the freedoms that we have, some of the freedoms that were threatened on September 11. And these 500 or so million of acres of public land is really, it's a concept that's in a sense uniquely American. Other cultures have their pyramids, their works of art. England and Spain has its great sea captains. Rome and Athens has its temples, the Far East has its dynasties. We have our public lands. We have our wild lands, our frontier. And this frontier really shaped the character of Americans. And our heroes are the likes of Lewis and Clark, Sacagawea, Chief Joseph, Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone. These are the people that we admire. And their skills, they endured the frontier. It shaped their character, and it's part of what we are as a nation. And our challenge in the future is to continue to protect this core. There was a time that uh, the landscape in the West, the public lands, were viewed as an inexhaustible resource, a resource that uh, individuals could personally profit from, and uh, nobody seemed to care. But that all changed about 100 years ago. And we do now care. Uh, we paid a high price. We saw the environmental disasters. Uh, we saw the cut and run era in the area that I grew up in, uh, northern Wisconsin, with the, uh, the tremendous pine forest, the hemlock forest, uh, that no longer exists today. Uh, we saw the uh, tragedy of the commons in the west and uh, the grazing issues that occurred here in the 1800s. Uh, We've learned from that. Uh, we saw the degradation. Well, September 11 uh, of this year is a day that a lot of people will remember. But September is an important month for another reason, because another very tragic event occurred that changed the course of history, particularly the course of conservation history. And that event occurred 100 years ago, on September 6, uh, 1901, when a shot was fired. A shot was fired by a disturbed anarchist named Leon Chagall. That seriously wounded President McKinley while he was attending the Pan Am Exposition in Buffalo, New York. Theodore Roosevelt at the time was speaking to members of the Vermont Fish and Game League at a luncheon on Lake Champlain. On hearing the news, Roosevelt and his aides rushed to be at the president's side in Buffalo to monitor his condition. By the 10th of September, 
President McKinley had begun to improve. So the Vice President thought, well, this would be a good time to take a few days off. So he met his family at Camp Tahawas, which is one of the remote, very remote areas in the state of New York, at the base of Mount Marcy, which is the highest peak in the state of New York. They spent the night in a cabin. Um, T.R., his wife Edith, two of his sons, hiked about halfway up the mountain, spent the second night. Edith and the kids went back down the mountain. T.R. and his team ascended to the peak, got there about 11 in the morning, started back down, had lunch at Lake Tier of the Clouds, which is the highest point uh, of the source of the Hudson River. While they were having lunch, a guide came out of the woods with a yellow telegram. And the telegram brought news that uh, the president's condition had worsened. And the vice president was to immediately come to Buffalo. So they hiked down the mountain, boarded a night train to Buffalo. T.R. and his aides got there in the morning to hear the news that McKinley had died. That night, Teddy Roosevelt took the oath of office and became the 26th president of the United States. Roosevelt's rise shocked many of the political leaders of the time and many of the leaders of his own Republican Party. He had joined the, the vice presidential ticket reluctantly only after being pushed into that post by party leaders who wanted him out of New York. Uh, they felt that to put him in the dusty attic of the vice presidency was a good place to put this guy that had this leaning toward conservation legislation. The political cognoscente in New York wanted this bull moose out of their china shop that was threatening their profits. And now, as the leader of the Republican Party said, that damn cowboy is president. And in fact, uh, that series of events changed the course of, of conservation history. So when we look at September 11, uh, it's really very difficult for us to predict what kind of impact that will have. Now, if we look back in uh, my last uh, several years in uh, uh, leader, agency leadership jobs, I started to spend more and more time reading the history and, and really realizing how valuable that was to look back and to see what happened and try to uh, uh, then use that uh, to sort of look ahead of the headlights. But it was interesting in Teddy Roosevelt's day because it wasn't since Thomas Jefferson that we had a president, a chief executive, that was so well informed in natural sciences. In fact, if we look at some of his diaries, and if you haven't read Edmund Morris's The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt, I recommend it. It's a, it's a good read and uh, very, very instructive. But if we look at uh, some of the diaries where on a typical day on the campaign trail, Teddy Roosevelt might give seven speeches, dictate letters, meet with the press, but he would reserve from 12 to 12.30 to do things like ornithological readings. Can you imagine uh, a politician at that level being so well informed? Uh, I think we long for the day uh, for that kind of informed leadership <laughs> on issues. <laughs> and now that damn cowboy that hyperactive intellectual was in the White House. And in fact, his tenure from 1901 to 1909 was tumultuous, it was invigorating, it was dramatic, it was provocative, and it was challenging, and it defined what conservation is and remains today. To be conservative, to be conservative with the land, the very root of the word implies, which in many cases today, it seems as though it's almost the opposite of what the conservative elements of certain parties 
a focus on when it comes to conservation and the environment. Well, Roosevelt's legacy is 